On today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, that Taylor Swift concert movie, you and your Swifty friends can get your own private theater at Cinemark for just the low price of $800. Drew Barrymore is bringing back her talk show during the strikes. Some people like it, some people don't. We're going to discuss that. Also, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny may have flopped at the box office, but it's doing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 level numbers on home video. Also, back in 2020, Taika Waititi said he was making a Star Wars movie. It's 2023, so he says he still doesn't have a script. And on top of all that, the Writers Guild of America is apparently having some massive infighting, ending in screaming hangups, according to reports. That and a whole bunch more. The John Campbell Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Move Related Show on the Planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studios, brought to you in part by our friends over at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it's an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, not just giving you our own opinions, but giving you some information, history and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different from ours. I'm joined in studio today by Ray Ora. Hey, hey. Jonathan Voikos here. Hey, everybody. And writer, director, producer, lover of For All Mankind, Robert Meyer Burnett is here. Robert, how you doing? <laughs> oh, man, there's a new trailer and a new date, November 10th, John. The yeah. return of For All Mankind. And uh, most importantly... You guys are here. Thanks a lot for being here, making this show part of your day. Here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by going over those topics that I just listed off. Then in the last part of the show, we're going to take questions from our beloved YouTube channel members. For those of you who listen to our podcast, we also have a YouTube channel, and we have a great dedicated group of supporters known as our YouTube channel members. And every day, we ask them to send in some topics and questions, and we get through as many as we can. Also, I want to remind you guys, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, we do this show as a podcast. There is a daily audio-only podcast simply known as the John Campia Show podcast, that we not only put this show up, but also open mic up on that podcast feed as well. So go and subscribe to it today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcasting app of choice is. So the next time you need an audio-only version, it's there when you need it. All right. With that all down, guys, let's talk about this, shall we? So the movie exhibition world got rocked the other week when they announced out of nowhere that Taylor Swift's era's tour that she's on right now which is by the way it's official it's the biggest music tour in the history of music it's good they say it's going to ring in about two billion dollars um i I know it's ridiculous um but they're going to put it out in movie format a concert movie coming to theaters on october 13th and the day they announced it is the day they put the tickets on sale ticketing websites crashed it might end up being i mean it's going to be one of only five movies that gets into the triple digits for opening weekend box office. I have a feeling it has a shot of being the number one opening weekend of the year, to be honest with you. But how big it gets, we'll wait and see. Well, all the Swifties started buying tickets, but now, according to a report in Variety, if you got a Cinemark near you and you and your fellow Swifties want to just have your own party and shake it off together, you can do that. This comes to us from Variety. It says this. Well, Cinemark is offering moviegoers a chance to rent out auditoriums to watch the film version of Taylor Swift's Eras Tour, which hit th- hits theaters on October 13th. Private Swifty parties, as the theater renters uh, rentals have been dubbed, cost $800 plus taxes and fees and can accommodate up to 40 people. That may sound like a lot of cash, but remember that some Swifties paid as much for a single concert ticket to the pop star's epic arena tour now this isn't a really brand new concept i mean during the pandemic certain theater chains including amc theaters they started the ability for people to rent a theater privately for their own friends pick a movie and for like 300 bucks sometimes 400 bucks you can have up to 40 people and go into the theater and have your own private viewing experience Them doing this with the Taylor Swift concert tour is brilliant because number one, the tickets have already been on sale and they've sold a lot of tickets. And you know that a lot of people have those tickets are also going to be booking their own private parties. This is also about twice as expensive as a regular booking a theater for a private screening of a movie. Like I said, you go to AMC theaters right now and you look up a lot of them, you're spending $250, $350 for a new movie. 
Now, this is going to be $800. Capped at 40 people. So you, even if the auditorium holds 100 people, you're capped at 40 people. That means you're going to be spending about 20 bucks per person, which ultimately is the cost of a movie ticket anyway. The difference is it's just going to be you and your 39 closest, most personal friends. Rob, this is actually genius on their part because <laughs> they're going to, since the tickets have been on sale for a while, we already went over all the auditorium. We saw how many of these screens are already sold out. There are people who have all their tickets, maybe even two, three sets of tickets who are also going to be booking private parties for them and their friends and stuff like this. I think this is a pretty smart move on their part. I think they could make it a bit cheaper, to be honest with you, than $800. I think if I were a Swifty, I don't think I would book it for 800 bucks. But, you know, everybody kicks in 20 bucks. maybe you got it. What do you think about this move? Well, dude, like you said, this is genius. And if you think about it, like you've got, let's say you're a mom or a dad, and you've got two daughters, they've got their friends, they've got their parents, they've got aunts and uncles. I mean, you could pick your your favorite families. I could see this as not just being a uh, an individual thing. I think it's a, a, a great family event. Like if you couldn't afford tickets, uh, it's a way that, that parents can maybe give back to their kids that weren't lucky enough to go see the concert for whatever reason. They can all go together, make it a big event. And like you said, 20 bucks a person? This is like, nothing and they can all dance in the aisles if they want and i think this is a great idea i wonder you know i'm curious because this is such a this isn't even amc that's distributing the, yeah, this is the movie. The cinemark it's yeah. cinemark that that's clearly uh which which is really interesting to think that this is not just one theater chain it's a bunch of theater chains and i'm wondering if this is a deal that maybe even the swifty and i don't know what the name of her company is but i want to say it's whatever swiftish company name she has it, it was it their idea either way it's a great it's a great thing i think it's a great thing for families it's a great thing for people that love taylor swift and i wish i'd thought of it i can already <laughs> tell i can tell you right now who the two biggest demographics of people renting these theaters are number one and no, in no particular order but we're gonna start off with number one the mom, dad, or aunt or uncle who wants to be the cool mom, dad, aunt or uncle who's going to say, for my little Susie, I'm booking your own theater. Invite your friends. So that's, that's going to be number one. The second one is little Billy and Tommy in, who are juniors in high school who maybe get together and say, we're going to spend our entire year's worth of money and we're going to invite these three girls who we know are Taylor Swift fans. We're going to book a private theater just just for us and these girls. I'm guaranteeing you those are the two top ticket purchasing demographics of this. And I also, make a lot of people off a lot of money off those sad people. I think you're right, but don't don't count out grandma and grandpa mm. that no don't normally go to concerts. Yeah. I mean, this is the grandma and grandpa. They they also are going to come up with this idea, especially like grandma's going to come up with the idea, but grandpa she'll she'll let grandpa take the credit. You know, and he'll present <laughs> it to the family or whatever. But I mean, I this is the kind of thing that I I I my um my grandmother, Sissy, that's what we call her, Sissy. It's not because she was a sissy. Her name was Sissy Schoenfeld. <laughs> so she would have she would have been all over this. As a matter of fact, she would have known this was happening before I knew this was happening. And she would have brought it to us and said, I have a thing that I want you kids to come with me to go see. And well, we would have gone. Anna, it's also just great for films. Anna and I, when Shang-Chi was out, Anna and I... We private rent now. It wasn't eight hundred dollars, right? But we private rented an AMC theater and had a bunch of the, the the Filipino side of the family all come and get together, and we all went out. You know, we got our nieces and everything, and our, our her cousins, and we all went to go watch Shang. It's a really fun thing to do. Yeah, and uh, I think you're going to see a lot. I, these these private theaters are going to be booked out. I guarantee you, completely. They're be completely booked out. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Don't know if you heard, but there's strikes going on. Uh, writer strike, actor strike, no movies are being made, no movies are being promoted. Uh, it, it's a, a pretty grim time. But there is uh, one show going back into production, Drew Barrymore's show, who I, quite frankly, didn't even know she had a show. And apparently it's going into its fourth season. Again, I never even knew she had a show. But it's going into its fourth season, and it's raised the ire of some people. That she's going back into production because normally she has a, a couple of WGA member writers on her staff and they're going to go ahead and make this show uh, without them. Some people think it's a really good idea. Some think it's people it's a really bad idea. And that happens to be the topic of today's Mint Mobile 
hotline question of the day. Listen, guys, if you've got a topic or a question for our show and you'd like to hear your voice on our show, go ahead and call it in anytime, 24-7 at 951-268-4259. Every day we pick one or two questions, and today's is about good idea, bad idea for Drew Barrymore to go back into production. Check it out. Hey, John and crew. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this whole Drew Barrymore debacle. I know there's a lot of controversy with her going back and starting her show up again during the strikes. People are calling her a scab, but then other people are saying she's doing a good thing by employing her non-WGA members so they can make money during the strike. So I wanted to get your thoughts. Thanks. Have a great day. All right. Thanks a lot for calling that in. And, you know, this is a topic... For those of you listening to the podcast or just watching the main show and maybe didn't see us do this on open mic, we, we actually kind of touched on this on open mic a couple of days ago. But I thought for the people who watch the main show and for our podcast listeners, it'd be a, a good discussion to have. Plus, I'm glad Rob is here because it, you, for, with open mic, it was just me. I'd like to get his take on this too. So here's the basic gist. Drew Barrymore, who again, I didn't even know how to show. But she's decided and her thing is like, look, we've the 95%, 99% of our crew and staff are not members of SAG and they're not members of the WGA. They're not on strike. And, but if we don't make this show, they're not going to be getting earning a living and earning an income. And she said, you know what, with that in mind, we're going to follow the strike rules. We're not going to promote upcoming movies. We're not going to promote upcoming projects on struck projects. But we're going to go ahead and make our show and and make it more casual talk, all this kind of stuff. Now, uh, I believe if you're on strike, you're on strike. That being said, and I know I, this is not a popular opinion for me to take, but I, when have I ever given two squirts of piss whether my opinion is the popular one or not? I got to say, I don't see any problem with Drew Barrymore going back and bringing her show on, especially with the vast majority of her uh, cast and crew, her, her crew and everything are going to be able to go back to work. Here's the thing. Number one, and Rob, I said this on uh, Open Mic the other day. This is a talk show. And while I completely believe, don't misinterpret me, I completely agree and believe that having good writers on a talk show can absolutely make a talk show better. 100% I am in no disagreement on that. That being said, you'd have to be naive to not think that you don't need to have writers to have two people sitting on a couch talking about something or having a conversation or what have you, right? Like, is it better to have writers? Yes. Do you need to have writers on a talk show? I'm sorry, no, you don't. You, you really don't. And so I, I put that one aside. Also, there's a little bit of a, there's, there's a lot of gray, complicated areas in this because unlike other times of strikes, there are these strikes going on right now, and yet there are some movies still being made. The Venice Film Festival just happened, and actors and writers are not supposed to be promoting movies, but there they are at Venice Film Festival. Now, granted, these movies are ones that are either covered by waivers or temporary agreements, interim agreements, and stuff like that, but still you have a situation where it's like, hey... I'm, I'm an actor or writer and uh, I'm on strike and I'm not working and I haven't had a paycheck in four months and yet I look at other members of my union and they're getting paid and they're working and stuff like that. Now, and to be clear, I am all for interim agreements and waivers for certain projects. I believe it's common sense. I'm all for them. I'm not trying to say I'm against them, but I'm saying you've got a situation here where you got some writers and actors working and others not. And here you have a show that is, by the way, the Drew Barrymore show, which I've never watched is not replacing the WGA writers they have. They're just going to move on with their show without them and try to follow all the rules of the strike. So I, I think it's just common sense that they should be allowed to do this. Now, one of the arguments that I heard, I think is particularly asinine, the argument of, well, people in this industry should stand in solidarity with those who are on strike. So if we're not working, you shouldn't be working. Bullshit. Because I want to remind everybody of something. When the writers were on strike, and the writers were on strike a long time before the actors went on strike, you know who was still working? The actors. The writers were on strike. The actors didn't go, no, we're not going to keep shooting our movies. We're not going to keep working because we're going to stand in solidarity with our fellow entertainment industry people, the writers. Now, they didn't do that. They kept right on working. 
It's like, well, well, because the writers are on strike. We're not on strike, so we're going to keep working. And I have no problem with that. that. That's perfectly reasonable. But now to try to double standard this and say, well, other people should be standing in unity with us. Well, the actors never stood in unity with the writers when the actors weren't on strike. They kept working. So why shouldn't other people in the entertainment industry who are not on strike, if given the opportunity to still work and not violate any rules, work? Look, is this a, a touchy subject? And is there more nuance than I'm giving it credit for right now? Absolutely, there is. 100%. This is not a black and white thing. This is a Fifty Shades of Grey situation. 1,000% it is. I'm making it sound like it's just one or the other. It's not. There's a lot of in between. But... Rob, when I look at this situation with Drew Barrymore, what I see is just a lot of very upset people who are looking for something to take their disgruntledness out on. Because this is a case of a show that had a couple of writers. Like, we're not talking about a 10-person staff writing room and blah, blah, blah. Had a couple of writers. They're not scabbing out those writers' jobs. They're not replacing those writers. They're going to go on and just do a show that does not step on the toes of any of the other things. And I find this idea that, well, if you're in the industry, you shouldn't be working either because we're not. I find that to be asinine. I, and again, I say this as somebody who 90% of the issues going on the strike, I side with the writers and the actors on 90% of the stuff. But I think this, it's like, this is the thing you're making your issue out of? I, I don't know. I think it's kind of ridiculous. I think Drew Barrymore should 100% be allowed to go ahead and make this little talk show. She's not making a drama. She's not making a comedy series. It's a talk show for fuck's sakes. But anyway, that's there's many different points of view on this. And Rob, you and I have never talked about this. No. I am very curious about your point of view on this. Well, I think you brought up a lot of good points. And I think some of the things that people forget about this is when the writers went on strike, Drew Barrymore did not host the MTV that's Music right. Video she she backed out of it. It backed out of it in solidarity with the writers. Um, a talk show is 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 not uh, does not fall under the same auspices as a movie or a regular scripted television series. The ideas about residuals and writers' rooms and things like that don't really apply to a talk show. Drew Barrymore is also SAG. That's right. So so she's she's rebuffing i guess to you know both the writers guild and but like you pointed out there are other shows like the view that's still on you know they're not stopped by the strike and i would say of, of all of the things that there's not a lot of what both sag because she's not working as an actress in this show she's the host which is different different contracts she's also a producer so this is her business and she has a crew of people, like you pointed out, that she is responsible for. Uh, on her staff, there are three WGA writers. And like you pointed out, she's not hiring other WGA writers to come in. She's uh, following the guidelines. Uh, like, she's not going to promote struck companies' material. The question is, the overarching company that might own the Drew Barrymore show yes. is probably a struck company. Right. So there's a lot of, there's, like you said, a lot of nuance in here. But as she came right out and said, I own this. You know, I'm, I own this decision. I've made this decision to go back. I think for all the people, look, I understand the idea of um, you're, you're either with us or against us. The, in this particular case, the show itself does not necessarily represent what it is that the writers or the actors are striking over. Thousand percent. Thousand and so percent. and so there is a there is an argument to be made that you should not be holding this up as this big example of somebody crossing your picket lines. Because on the other hand, she's also a person that is thinking about her crew and they've been off since April. Yeah. You know, and it's it's a nuanced thing. I mean, a crew who are not a part of the unions that are on strike, not a part of the unions that are on strike, predominantly not on strike. And and she did show solidarity. She has pulled out of events. It's cost her money. She's shown that, yes, I'm I'm there with you. But at some point, somebody has to say, I mean, what is the first adage of show business? Show, show must, must go, go on. on. And I'm conflicted myself about this. But I have to say, I'm leaning more toward in this particular instance to understand where she's coming from. 
is that going to is that going to be a popular opinion? The thing is, I really don't know. I keep waiting to hear. I haven't read a breakdown, John, of this whole thing. I just hear that everyone's mad at Drew Barrymore, and this is going on. I have not heard her rationale and reasoning behind it. She said, "This is on me. I take all the responsibility for doing it." But I want to read a breakdown from a from a monetary standpoint, who owns what, and this, that, and the other thing, before I can render my final judgment. But I'm leaning more toward. I understand what she's doing, and I can't falter for it. Yeah, I, I agree right now. I, I just think there's a lot of places to be placing frustration and anger. I don't think this is the place to put it. I don't think this is the, the hill you die on, uh, is the Drew Barrymore show. No, because also because it isn't, unfortunately, or fortunately, it isn't. it doesn't follow the constraints of what most of everyone is fighting for. So if you look at what SAG's looking to get and when you look at what the Writers Guild is looking to get, talk shows are way on the outside of that. So, all right. With that down, guys, let's move on to this here thing, shall we? You know, we were talking the other day about some of the big surprise hits of the year, you know, and there have been some big ones. But there were also a number of very high profile flops. And sadly, one of those flops, just whatever you think about the movie itself. By the way, I didn't think the movie was all that bad, but it flopped, it was Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Uh, that did not do very well. Did It only made around, Ray, you can fact check me on this, but I think it made around like $350 million. I believe that was it. Which is less than a Black Adam. It's less than a black atom. It's 382. $382 million it made. So couldn't even get to the $400 million mark for an Indiana Jones film, right? It's a flaw. Again, I didn't think it was a bad movie, but it did not do well. Well, for some reason, though, this movie seems to be doing really well on home video, which is odd, as well as one of the biggest films of the year, Guardians of the Galaxy. This comes from CBR who write the following. Per Samba TV, Dial of Destiny has been a hit in the VOD market since it became available via major digital platforms on August 29th, with the action-adventure film attracting 474,000 viewers within its first six days. By comparison, box office hits like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse were watched by 482,000 and 321,000 people respectively via VOD within their first six days of availability. Now, put that in context, Guardians of the Galaxy made over $800 million at the box office. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse made over $600 million at the box office. So more than double of what Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny made at the box office. And yet, somehow, some way, for some reason... As many people are tuning into it on home video as they did for Guardians of the Galaxy, and more people are watching it than are watching Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, a movie that made double what Indiana Jones made at the box office. Rob, you're looking at these sorts of numbers. I, I'm a little bit at a loss. How do you rationalize, or what do you think was one of the causes or some of the factors that go into a movie that made less than half the money than these movies did at the theaters, and yet just as many people or more are watching it at home right now. What do you ascribe that to? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I think a lot of people, even since the pandemic has been essentially quote-unquote over, uh, people that didn't go back to the movie theaters waited to watch this on VOD. No, that's true. You know, yeah. you, had, you had older audiences, I think, people that have been watching it. I mean, this is a 42-year-old franchise. So if you were 30 years old, when Raiders came out, you're an Indiana Jones fan. You're 72 now. Did you roll out and go see it? Probably not. I mean, uh, even even um, uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is 15 years old. So, and you were you were in your 50s when that came out. Now you're 72. You didn't roll out to see this in the theater. Be like, oh, I can't wait to see a new Indiana Jones movie. And you were waiting to see this. That's why people, I think, have watched it. And that's just the beginning. I mean, I think a lot of people didn't get out to the theaters. That this movie really suffered from the can, the post can yeah, word of mouth. Yeah, that it was first sort of, negative reviews. They really hurt their. It momentum. was really made a whipping boy. And I think, like you, you know, I would put this like a good mid-level Bond movie. Mm. It wasn't awful. It wasn't tremendous, but it was good. I liked it. Yeah, I, I call it the fourth best Indiana yeah, Jones I, that's, film. Out that's of the what five. I would say. Yeah, I would a hundred percent. And, and I think that people are watching it, and some people that didn't go are watching it just to see, and they're like, okay. 
And I think it's probably going to do, you know, more business. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the next couple of weeks it passes a million VOD views. Oh, yeah, it absolutely will. You know what? I guess maybe one of the other factors that I didn't think about was the fact that it is a big very one of the most popular ips in the history of the movie business maybe the fact that so few people saw it in movie theaters meant that there were still a lot of people who hadn't seen it and they might be more apt to then rent it at home whereas you know you know i, I went to see guardians of the galaxy volume three a couple of times in theaters i haven't watched it at home yet oh wait a minute no i take that back i did watch it at home once but there have been a lot of movies that i've seen in theaters and loved that i didn't then get on vod later because i had already seen the film you know what i mean and maybe the reverse of that is at play here with Indiana Jones. I don't know. I just thought that was a really interesting fact. All right, guys, listen. We still got to talk a little bit of Taika Waititi still not having a Star Wars script. Infighting now happening with the WGA. But before we get to those things, we're going to take a quick second and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. Our friends at Masterclass and Vessi. We want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of this video, Masterclass. Guys, you know, as a small business owner, I am finding myself having to be in negotiations all the time, whether it's with new contractors, vendors, or even agencies that represent our company. Now, I don't like to go into these negotiations unarmed, so I found the perfect class on Masterclass, The Art of Negotiation by Chris Voss, a real-life former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Taking this class on Masterclass made me feel a lot more equipped and confident going into all these various negotiations I have to do on a regular basis. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. An annual membership starts at just $10 a month, and you get unlimited access to every instructor, thousands of online lessons, exclusive content, insight, and much more. There are over 180 classes to pick from, everything from filmmaking with Martin Scorsese all the way to cooking with the great Gordon Ramsay. In Masterclass, you will find practical lessons that you can apply to your life and work. So guys, get unlimited access to every class. And right now, as a John Campy Show listener, you can get 15% off when you go to masterclass.com slash campia. That's masterclass.com slash campia for 15% off an annual membership. Masterclass.com slash campia. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Vessi. Now, like me, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of Vessi, the shoe that claims to be incredibly comfortable and waterproof on top of that. Well, these claims are really interesting to me because as a Canadian who walked around in a lot of snow and as somebody who likes to go camping and hiking with his wife on the weekends, there's nothing more uncomfortable and horrible than walking around in wet feet. So after receiving my first pair of Vessis and noticing how incredibly good looking the shoes are and how mind boggling, comfortable and flexible they are, the first thing I did was I took them into the backyard to put it to the supreme waterproof test and dipped my feet in my pool. Guys, my feet were bone dry. And like 20 seconds after having them in the pool and I touched them, the shoes themselves were also bone dry. Guys, seriously, these shoes are stupidly comfortable. They look great and they absolutely lived up to the claim of being waterproof and keeping my feet dry. I absolutely love my Vessi shoes. So guys, if you want shoes that are good looking, are ridiculously comfortable and on top top of all that waterproof, you need to head to Vessi.com slash Campia and get yourselves a pair today. Go to Vessi.com slash Campia and get shoes for your best summer yet. And thank you to our friends at Masterclass and Vessi for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this. Star Wars is a mess. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, that's... It just has, and listen, I say that as somebody who has liked a number of things that Star Wars has put out in recent years. I love Rogue One. Andor is the best thing they've done since the original trilogy. Uh, I really like The Force Awakens. Uh, the first season of Mandalorian, spectacular. There are things that they've done that I've really liked, but when you look past the things that have been good on screen and even look past the things that have been bad that they put on screen, it's a disorganized mess. One of the things that really highlights that is Taika Waititi, a filmmaker who I adore. I mean, yeah, Thor, Love and Thunder notwithstanding, Taika Waititi is a freaking genius. I love his stuff. Jojo Rabbit is still one of the best movies I've, I've seen in years. His Thor Ragnarok was incredible. What We Do in the Shadows is absolutely phenomenal. He's just great. And that dude married Rita Ora. I mean, this is a guy who's just winning at life. So I adore the guy. So it's understandable that back in May of 2020, I got real excited 
when they announced that Taika Waititi, who did a bang up job directing some of Mandalorian season one, I, I, I contend he directed the best episode of the, of the first season. But when they announced that Taika Waititi was going to be doing a Star Wars movie, oh, the heavens opened up and the angels, you know, Gloria sang glory, hallelujah. It was amazing. Couldn't wait. It is now September of 2023. And we still don't have anything. And according to Taika himself, he doesn't still have a script. Now, Taika Waititi was recently at the Toronto International Film Festival, where he was like introing uh, an honorary award being uh, given to Sean Levy. And it said this, this comes to us from Geek Tyrant, but this is what was said. So uh, Waititi recently showed up at the Toronto International Film Festival Tribute Award to honor free guy director Sean Levy with the inaugural Norman Jewish and Career Achievement Award. While giving a speech, Waititi mentioned Levy's planned Star Wars movie and in the process commented on his own Star Wars project saying, unlike me, let's hope he manages to finish as a script for that. <laughs> so here we are. Now, Rob, over the last couple of years, we've had people write in to this show and say, hey, do you still think we haven't heard a lot? Do you still think this Taika movie is going to be happening? And I've said, hey, it's going to still happen. He's working on He's got next goal wins coming out, which apparently is being received pretty well. Um, so he's kind of busy, but yeah, it'll come. It'll come. Rob, I got to tell you, we're now three and a half years since they announced that Taika was going to be doing a Star Wars movie. Taika himself is acknowledging they don't have a script still. I have lost faith. I officially no longer believe, and maybe other people have gotten there a year or two ago, but I'm just getting there now. I no longer believe that this Taika Waititi project is actually going to happen. Just like I don't believe the Kevin Feige uh, movie that they announced, that Kevin Feige was doing a Star Wars film. I don't believe that's going to happen. Um, this, this whole Star Wars operation is in such a chaotic mess. Uh, how they managed to put out some really good things is a wonder to me, to be honest, a real testament to the talented people that they have involved over there. And I'm still really looking forward to the acolyte, by the way. Uh, but I do not, I officially do not believe this movie is going to happen at all. And it's only a matter of time till we hear an official word about it. Rob, you remember when they announced this movie uh, that Taika was going to be doing it? We see the current status of it. Do you think this movie's ever going to happen? No. <laughs> no, no, I do not, John. <laughs> I, I, here's the thing. You know, Taika Waititi now is an Oscar winner. And I think that Next Goal Wins is, is, is a passion project of his. Obviously, Jojo Rabbit was a passion project of his. Got him that Oscar. Uh, I think he's a really talented filmmaker. He's got a couple of TV shows, whether it's Reservation Dogs and What We Do in the Shadows, which are both great shows um, that are ongoing. I, I think that getting involved, I, I got to ask myself, would I want to see Taika Waititi tackle a Star Wars movie after Thor Love and Thunder? To be honest, no. Uh, I would rather see him do something that he is his, that's an original, that comes from his unique sensibility. And I think there's a reason why he hasn't written a Star Wars script in 20 or three years, since 2020. And if he's not, if, if he's not stoked about, you know, it's funny. Is anyone stoked about making Star Wars anymore with the exception of maybe Dave Filoni? you know, who basically has his writing and directing show on the air now. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to wade into those waters. And frankly, I would rather see Taika Waititi uh, do more original Taika Waititi-esque projects. I see, don't think this movie's going to happen. That, that's part of why I was excited for this, because, you know, with Thor Love and Thunder, you're in an established world with established characters, and there are certain things. You, and by the way, he killed it with Thor Ragnarok. Killed it. But killed it. Loved it. Whereas with Star Wars... They gave him carte blanche to go to any corner of the galaxy that he wanted and make something. Uh, yes, this is the universe you're inhabiting, but do whatever you want in it. And that's why I was kind of, it's not like they said, take Ray and, um, you know, I, I don't know, C-3PO. Take Ray and C-3PO and make a buddy cop movie with established characters for him. You know, they said blank page, do what you want to do. And Rob, this is the other frustrating, this is the thing that really kind of highlights the Kathleen Kennedy era of Star Wars. You would think before you officially announce that somebody's doing the movie that you would have already had the script. Yeah. Or at least, at least the treatment. You would have at least thought there was a seven page outline done and ready to go and say, yes, this is the story we need to tell and whatever. And and again, I again, I think somebody, 
I am somebody who thinks Kathleen Kennedy is a first ballot Hall of Famer in Hollywood. I think she's one of the greatest producers of all time. But this is the epitome of what her reign at Lucasfilm has been. There's been there's so many examples like this. And it's really, really frustrating. You know, the thing, too, is I was hoping that T Taika Waititi would probably make or, or, the first humorous, I mean, out-and-out -out humorous Star Wars film. Now, I don't mean a parody or something farcical. Like, Star, Star Trek Lower Decks refers to Star Trek, other Star Trek episodes all the time. It's a goof. but Tag, tag and Bink. How great well, would Taika Waititi directing Tag and Bink that, in something Star Wars like, The only thing about Tag and Bink is that it, it goes back and replays events from the movie. Sure. But yes, but what I would love to see is don't refer to other things because what Andor shows is you can delve into parts of the Star Wars universe we haven't seen before, like the rise of, of the what is it what does a workaday empire look like and what mm -hmm. does the beginnings of the rebellion look like, but there is comic gold in the Star Wars universe. Tag and Bing, Kevin Rubio showed us that brilliant, brilliant conceit. He did a wonderful job. If you guys haven't read Tag and Bink, the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of the Star Wars universe, it's it's genius. You can get the graphic novel. But he would bring... Can you imagine a what we do in the shadows kind of a thing in the Star Wars universe? Oh, absolutely. And with characters that we don't know, new characters. Yep, new corners of the universe. New corners of the universe. I mean, if he did something like that, it could be gold. That I would love to see that. And I hope maybe, maybe John, maybe he will get around to doing something like that. I Who hope knows? he does, but he's had three and a half years. And uh, I know. Anyway, let's move on, shall we? Guys, this last topic here today is about the ongoing uh, writer strike. Now, look, when strikes go on this long, I've said this many times, nobody's happy. We already know that there's infighting going on amongst the AMPTP, the studios, right? Not all the studios are on the same page. And there is infighting and discussions and a little bit of backstabbing and a little bit of throwing under the bus, and all that kind of stuff is going on at the AMPTP because nobody's happy. It's not surprising then to hear that there's also that sort of stuff going on within the unions. Of course, the AMPTP will deny it. Of course, the unions will deny it. But it's the cracks are starting to show on all sides, right? Now, this was interesting. A few days ago, a story came out that a couple of high-profile showrunners, writers, members of the WGA, uh, including Noah Hawley, who did Fargo, and he did the he was the showrunner on Legion, uh, the showrunner for Blackish, and a couple of others that had some concerns, and they had scheduled this was in the Hollywood Reporter that they had scheduled a meeting with the WGA leadership to sit down and talk about the status of the strike. Well, in Yahoo News today, we found out that meeting got canceled, and it wasn't a happy canceled. Uh, this comes to us from Yahoo News who write the following. The Writers Guild of America canceled a scheduled meeting with top Hollywood showrunners, including Kenya Barris and Noah Hawley, on Monday after a week of intense bickering over whether the Guild is adequately, adequately seeking a resolution to the entertainment industry's crippling four-month-old strike, the rap has learned. Uh, Barris from Blackish, Hawley from Fargo, and of course Legion, and numerous powerful showrunners have been demanding answers from the WGA negotiating leadership, namely Chief Negotiator Ellen Stutzman and Committee Co-Chairs Chris Kaiser and David A. Goodman to ensure that the Guild was motivated to get a deal. The showrunners, this is where it gets interesting, the showrunners began to reach out for clarification last Tuesday, and the exchanges with WGA leadership has been described to the rap by an individual with knowledge as intense and emotional, with phone calls between individual showrunners and guild leaders leading to fights, shouting matches, and quote-unquote screaming hang-ups, as the individual put it. Now, uh, the rap one of the big trades in the industry reached out to the reps for the showrunners and to the WGA. Not surprisingly, the reps from the showrunners did not respond for comment. The WGA said something interesting. They said the story's not true and then didn't clarify. And, but then they did follow up. They said, by the way, it was the showrunners who canceled the meeting to me. That's like saying, hey, I heard you went on a date with your wife in a restaurant and a screaming match ensued and you threw a bowl of soup at her. To which you reply, that's not true at all. And by the way, she's the one who threw the bowl of soup at me. <laughs> it's Okay, anyway, we've seen the breaks. 
We've seen the cracking. We've seen the throwing under the bus on the AMPTP. We are starting to see it in the WGA, where some members, including some senior members of the WGA, are thinking that the leadership of the WGA isn't really interested in getting a deal done. Or at least they're not doing, or they're just sticking their, they're digging their heels in on, we want what we originally asked for, regardless of anything else. Whereas some other people in the WGA are saying, we're going to have to compromise in some places. I mean, that's, that's what deal making is. And to have high profile people like this come out, uh, Rob, look, I'm not surprised. The, this, the WGA strike is now at 130 plus days, yeah. right? Over four months. I'm not surprised to see infighting amongst the studios. I'm not surprised by that at all. These are individuals in the WGA and, and the Screen Actors Guild by extension, you know, working people who are just trying to get a fair deal and work their jobs. Not surprised to see that there's some infighting going on over there too. Chris Carr often talks about that even within very unified, you know, unions, there's, there's going to be different personalities and there's going to be conflict in politics. You read this story. What's standing out to you the most? Are you surprised to hear about this? I, I don't know. What do you think about this whole situation? Well, first of all, like I know David Goodman, who's on the negotiating committee. I think he's a really good guy. He's even been on my YouTube show a couple times. Uh, he was an executive producer of Orville. He worked on Star Trek. I've known him for a while. Terrific guy. And he's on their negotiating committee. The thing is, though, they were talking about, and yesterday, by the way, was the showrunner day. I believe it was in front of Fox that all the showrunners came to show solidarity and protest out in front of the studio. I think it was in front of Fox, but it was yesterday. I think, though, that showrunners are not just in charge of their writers' rooms. They're in charge of their whole crew, everybody. And I'm sure that showrunners themselves are now fielding calls from you know, their camera departments, their grip and electrical departments. Are we working? How long is this going to go on? And they're probably getting pressure from people that have nothing to do with this strike. They just want to go back to work. And the showrunner's like, can we, what's what's the problem? What is it we need to, what do we need to fix? So the showrunners are getting pressure from places that the writers themselves are not getting. And, and just to be clarify for people who are listening to this and may not understand some of the terminology, the showrunners are not studio. They are writers. The, these are WGA members themselves. Many times who created are, the shows that are being written. Usually the creators, yes. Please continue. Oh, and so, the, you know, but they're also running the show. The showrunners are doing just that, which means all the rest of the crew that work on these shows. Like, you have actors, of course, and you have a writing staff, but you have 100 crew members that make a show run. And everybody from the caterers to the grip and electric to the camera people to costumes and, and, and makeup and script supervision and all of this. And so they're the ones going, having to field calls. When do we get to go back to work? And it's got to be incredibly pressure filled when they're getting phone calls from people that have nothing to do with this strike, except the fact that they're out of work going, I'm going to lose my house. So that's why these showrunners, I think, wanted to have this meeting to find out where we at, what can I tell people, what can I tell the other people that I, I'm the one that I have to hire again, and I'm sure that's why you're seeing things that are fractious. And another thing, John, that's different than previous strikes is you have players in the game like Netflix, like Apple, like Amazon that aren't like studios. Yeah. And so, really muddies the waters. It, and yes, yeah, so it's hard to negotiate. Apple's like, look, our primary business is not making movies and shows for Apple Plus. We sell hardware and software. This is just an adjunct business for us. So now we're being lumped in on this. And what are we supposed to do? We don't really know. And it's tough to negotiate now. And mm, it's a mess. Well, I mean, here's hoping that they're going to be able to get this resolved and get this thing all together. And again, lest you think this is just like the WGA. That's, listen, the studios themselves have fractures and are infighting and stuff like that. Tensions are getting high. Uh, people are on the hot seat. Some people haven't been able to pay their bills. I mean, it's going to be a high stress situation when you have people in a high stress situation, there's going to be conflict. So let's hopefully uh, see this conflict lead to a resolution, shall we? All right, guys, with all that down, we're now going to move over and start taking our YouTube channel members topics and questions. But before we get to that, we're going to take another quick second here and thank a couple of more sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at DraftKings and my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. We want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this episode, DraftKings. Football is back and in full swing with another week of epic games. And who's got you covered on the action for every single one of them? 
DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet $5 on football and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Nobody's missing out on all the action this season. All DraftKings customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. So get in on the NFL Week 2 action with DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app now and use the code CAMPIA to sign up. New customers can bet just $5 and take home $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with the code CAMPIA. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com dot com slash campia cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia and thank you to our friends at DraftKings and mint mobile for sponsoring this episode of the john campia show podcast all right guys with that down let's get over to our youtube channel member questions shall we jonathan what do we got up here first first up we got uh robert green who writes hey crew hope you're having a great day with the halloween season approaching what are some of your go-to horror movies to watch can i just say September 1st happened, Ann and I went into, I think, a Target, and they already had all the Halloween stuff out. I'm like, guys, it's still two months away. <laughs> can, can we can we take a break? And then Ann went to Costco. We're not Costco members anymore, although I, I really do like Costco. Ann went to Costco with her mom, her and Ray's mom the other day, and she goes, John, they got all the Christmas decorations out. I'm like, it's September. Anyway, uh, big horror movies that I will often go back to. I don't know that if you qualify Jaws as a horror movie. I like watching Jaws around Halloween time. I don't know why. I just really do. And uh, not every year, but every two or three years around Halloween time, I like going back to uh, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon is one I like to get to as well. But anyway, that's me. You got to go to Halloween. I movie? love devil movies on Halloween. So <laughs> it, whether you're going to go Omen, whether you're going to go, we're going to have Rosemary's Baby and Exorcist in 4K this year, but anything to do, like there's a great action film called Race with the Devil about a devil cult in the American Southwest. I love anything to do with possession, fear no evil, the Frank Lelogia movie. I don't care. Give me the devil. Give me old scratch coming up. I don't care if he's possessing teenagers or moms or whatever, or Damien, uh, you know, when, when Sam Neill played Damien in uh, oh, uh, right. the final yeah, conflict, yeah, yeah. Yes. you know, bring that on, you know, or, or the best devil Al Pacino and the devil's I was advocate. Say, so when you said, I'm a devil, fan of man. Yeah. When you said devil movies, I was going to say <laughs> that movie, you know, Oh my God. The devil's advocate's So good. My yeah. favorite devil thing is still Lucifer. Which is also <laughs> very great. different kind of devil thing, but I really like. I just go to the basic like Halloween, the original Halloween. I know you're not a huge fan of it, but I like the vibe of it, the '70s and all that. But you know what? When I was a kid, I used to love this: it the is. Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Yep. And to this day, it just has that feeling of like that time of year. And what would happen is it starts with Mr. Toad, it ends with the Ichabod story, and then it ends back with like. Uh, a real act, live action book kind of closing in a library or whatever and the lights dim and what would happen every single time is that movie would end i'd look around my parents had already gone to bed all the lights were off i'd get freaked out turn off the tv and run to my room and turn on the light you know what's a modern <laughs> more modern halloween seasonish kind of movie that i've just never been into what's the one with the it looks like a little kid running around with a 
pumpkin on his head or something. Mike Flan was did Mike Flanagan do it? Oh, is that a uh, trick or treat? Trick or treat. Did Mike Doherty move? Mike Doherty did it. That's the one. Yeah, trick or treat. Sam. A lot of Sam, people Mike really Doherty. love that movie. Yeah, I have. It's kind of an anthology movie. Yeah, I, I never liked it. I never thought it was, but everybody I know really likes that one. It's I mean, a more I, modern one. I do like Halloween themed. You know, I just watched the Disney just put out an incredible disc of Nightmare Before Christmas, which looks incredible. I love Nightmare Before Christmas. I love yeah, that yeah. that whole Halloween kind of vibe. You know, there's a TV movie. I want to say it's a TV movie called Scarecrows from mm -hmm. a long, it's like from the 80s. It's really good. It's really good. I mean, I do like that kind of stuff. You know, a Halloween theme. You know, even even the first Children of the Corn with Malachi, the original one. It's good stuff. All right. What's next? Yulatan writes, do you have any shows or movies that you liked more over time? When I first watched the prequel trilogy, I didn't like it that much. But over time, especially with Rebels and Ahsoka, I really appreciate those films more today than before. Yeah, my, mine was the opposite. I actually... <laughs> I tricked myself into liking the prequel trilogy when they first came out. And over and time, waned. I started to realize, oh, my God, these are so bad. Um, the only one I can really think of, like the, the one movie in my repertoire that I was like, I really did not like it the first time I saw it. And now I love the movie was Inglorious Bastards, Quentin Tarantino's film. I, I still don't know why I didn't like like the first time I saw it in theaters. I hated that movie, hated it. And then it was like a year or something later, I was watching it with a girl at my place because she wanted to watch it. And I'm like, okay, put it on. I'm like, was I in a bad mood the day I saw this? Like, I, and I love that. It's like my second favorite Quentin Tarantino movie now. Do you have any that's growing yeah, over time? Yeah, well, there's The Talented Mr. Ripley. Really? I, I saw The Talented, I, on Christmas <laughs> Day, I went to an Any Given Sunday and Talented Mr. Ripley double feature. I think I was monstrously hung over and we saw Talented Mr. Ripley <laughs> first. And I hated it. And this was Anthony Minghella who directed it because I love uh, English Patient. And I just, I don't know why. I can watch The Talented Mr. Ripley, especially before they killed Jude Law, just hanging out in Manja in Italy. I could watch that all day, every day. I love it. They're singing, you know, uh, to flow Americano, Americano. I love that. I want to go live in that movie now. I love it so much. Because I saw it once in theaters and I did not like it. I didn't like passionately hate it, but I but I did not like it. I've never watched it again since. So maybe I should because Anne likes that movie. The so whole know, opening in shot. Italy and stuff is great. And then it just becomes really tense where I I actually don't want a murderer to get caught. You know? Yeah, there are movies that can do that to you. All right, what's next? Okay, we got Alan who writes, Happy Wednesday can't be a crew. I'm thinking of watching the Expendable series before the fourth one comes out. Have you all seen these movies? If so, what are your thoughts? Two is good. Yeah, two And was, three wasn't bad. You know, I, I think two and three are actually better than the original. I agree. One. I, I think I think it's kind of, they did the first one, cool idea, and it's like, you know what? They worked out the kinks with the first one. And then they got into... I, I really feel like The Expendables found its real identity in 2 and 3. Um, I, I know it's, it's you know, off limits to say a little bit, but, man, Mel Gibson was really good in that one. Yeah, you're just a meat bag. <laughs> like, I... I I thought he was actually quite good in that. I really liked Wesley Snipes <laughs> in it, too. Um, again, not fantastic American cinema, but for what they are... It's, it's it's they're kind of fun i i be and listen i i'm looking forward to seeing the new one i know not a lot of people are they won't make any money but i'm looking forward to seeing the new one all right what's next um cj rebirth writes i'm so happy for the young actress who was in last night's ahsoka episode her name is ariana greenblatt she was recently in adam driver's 65 movie oh was that oh, yeah. her as well as uh the daughter in barbie yeah yeah that was her. oh i didn't realize this thing wow she's making moves right now yeah Good for her. You mean like the the daughter who like hated Barbie? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that she one. grew up a lot I, then because from sixty five to that. Right. Um, I, I'm just not talking about the Ahsoka series anymore. <laughs> but I'm super glad for that little girl. Like that's really cool when you see like a, a child getting that much work and all that kind of. Stuff. And you know what? I really quite liked her in sixty five, and I liked her in Barbie. So good for her getting that sort of those sorts of shots. All right, what's next? Uh, Dildar writes, going to start watching The Expanse after hearing a lot of good things about it. Uh, there's also a game by Telltale that's apparently good, too. Have you guys seen it? If so, what are your thoughts? Telltale did. I know Telltale did like Walking Dead ones. Yeah. They did uh, several, but and some Batman ones, too, didn't they? Yep. Yep. 
I did not know they had one for the expanse. I had never even heard of it. Listen, I was a little bit late to the expanse party. Uh, I think the first season was either almost done or done. And I never really, I, I didn't think it looked all that interesting. I had a lot of people, including Rob telling me just how good the show was. And I finally got onto it, got completely hooked on it. Uh, love, a, love the final season, but I love the show. The show is, I still don't know how to properly pronounce the name of their ship. The Rossinante. The Rossinante. Is that how you yeah. pronounce it properly? The Rick and Enti. The <laughs> Rossinante. Rick and Morty. Um, just, just such a great show. And I love that, that one character, the girl who's the belter who ends up being president of the universe at the end. I love that character. <laughs> She's so badass. I love that character. Anyway. All right. What's next? Okay. We got, uh, let me, all right. GK Goon writes, John, you caught up on winning time. Cannot wait for the season finale. I'm caught up on winning time. Ooh. This show's so good. <laughs> I heard some people saying, oh, this season's kind of a letdown. I'm like, what are you talking about? I actually think this season's better than the first season. Wow. I I love it. Now, granted, my all-time favorite basketball player is Larry Bird. So, like, seeing the way he's portrayed in the show. Are you up to date on winning yeah. time? I mean, I just the, there's this one scene where uh, who's the guy from The Shield? Uh, Michael Chiklis. Michael Chiklis, yeah. He comes walking in as, as Red. The guy, ah, good news. The Lakers are tanking. Their dynasty's over now. So it's all clear Sam for else. Their time is done. And Larry Bird's not even looking at him. He's like, I hope not. Because all he wants to do is beat Magic Johnson's ass. Like, <laughs> I hope not. Like, and that whole, did you see that episode that was like all about Larry? Yeah. Like, because oh. it was funny. We're watching it. And like, he walks into the university's gym to do his tryout for the team. And he walks in in jeans and everything. And I, being obsessed with Larry Bird, right, I turn to my wife and I go, by the way, this really happened. This is, she goes, really? And as soon as I said that, up on the screen, the Super, the Super Bowl title, <laughs> this really happened. Larry Bird comes out in his dungarees, jeans, whatever, and puts up 60. <laughs> and like in an intramural game, it's like, ah, those guys, a lot of people forget this now. But Magic and Larry saved the NBA. The NBA would not be what it is today if it wasn't for Magic and Larry. And, you know, Ray, we were talking about this the other day. The NBA has never been able to replicate it. No. Because Mike, Michael Jordan never had his Magic Johnson or his Larry Bird. Uh, Kobe Bryant never had his Magic Johnson or Larry Bird. LeBron doesn't have his the yin to his yang. Like, Magic and Larry just made the NBA. You know I want to I mean? say, you know, when I moved here in to LA to go to school, it was 1988. It was June of 88. And as I remember it, I, th I believe it was Bird and Magic were still playing at the time. Yeah. It was in Los Angeles. When I came down here, I mean, I'm from Seattle and we lost the Supersonics, but it was like a, everywhere I went, I'm like, what's with this? The, it's all this purple and gold everywhere i mean i understood i knew the lakers i didn't realize the entire city was swept up in this it was incredible i've never seen that kind of fervor the way it was when i first moved to la you know <laughs> yeah. and i was like man this they talk about a lakers dynasty man it's true the the, the this best is the lakers realm <laughs> the best comparison i think i have is the toronto maple leafs in toronto because I, I remember, like, it's almost the same here. It's it's cheaper for you. If you want to watch the Los Angeles Lakers play basketball, it's cheaper for you to get a flight to Sacramento and watch, get a hotel, and then watch the Lakers play in Sacramento. I remember I, I did the math. I had a, I've got some buddies in Nashville, and I was still living in, in Canada. And it was cheaper. I did the math. It was cheaper for me to fly to Nashville, get a hotel, and buy tickets to Toronto playing the Nashville Predators in Nashville than it was trying to get tickets to a Toronto Maple Leafs game. I mean, it's it's, it's well, some cities are just super passionate about their team. You know, one of the episodes that they just did was when the they lost to Houston when yeah. they Magic shot that shot. That's the day I believe I became a Laker fan because I wasn't watching basketball, but my dad was. Right, yeah, your dad was a big Laker. I was guy. playing Transformers at the edge of the bed, like on the floor, and he was watching. And I'm just playing with my Transformers, and all of a sudden, I hear my dad slap 
the the mattress like super loud and just this Filipino cuss word like just <laughs> and I look and I got when scared I got scared shot. I turned around with my transformers and then I guess they had just lost that was the game where Magic threw up and he was so pissed and I said that's I guess I'm a Laker fan now I don't know well I mean I I didn't I didn't hardcore. find this out until I think a year after Ann and I got married but your dad was a baller. Yeah, your dad was. balled. We had a court back then, and then like I would be trying to shoot, and then he would come back there, and then he would just like drain like five shots in a row, and then just go back inside and start cooking. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> what, why, why didn't any of that rub off on me? Nothing. I I'm remember just breaking too, shots all day. <laughs> it, it was. I, I'm gonna guess it was maybe like either on the one year or the two year anniversary after your dad passed away. And, you know, it's it, obviously it's a very emotional time for Ann and for Ray too. Uh, their dad was a great man. And I, I mean, I knew about Ann loves the Lakers and she totally got it from her dad, totally got it from dad. And so I remember, um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting choked up. I remember it was either, either the first or second anniversary after he passed away. And I said to Ann, because Ann had mentioned, you know, dad always wanted to get courtside seats. Oh yeah. And so I said, you know what? Let's just, I had some money saved up for something else, but I said, why don't let's get courtside seats and, uh, for your dad, let's go. And so we got the, now granted they weren't where Jack sits courtside seats. It was like <laughs> under the basket courtside oh, come on, seats. Man. Cause that's, come on, man. that's, that's what I enough. can afford. You could probably smell the players from there anyway. Uh, yeah, well, you could, you may have seen there looking at them in the eyes or on the free throw line. It was pretty and cool. Plus, if someone runs out and tries to save a ball, that's a good area to be in. Yeah, we you know? catch them and everything like that. And we yeah. got on, we, you'd see us on TV. You watch some of the replay because we're right under the basket. Were, were you next there. to the home team or the away team? Oh, we way. were by the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. see? You, yeah. Could, you could yell at them. So we got real you. good, like, looks at LeBron and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. that was a really cool day. We went and and did courtside and Ann, Ann once, had man. a ball. It was a gotta good one. Go do it. All right, sorry, we spent a lot of time on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Joel Checky and I did a little research on this question while we were talking. Apparently at the 2006 Oscars, George Clooney uh, was nominated for an acting award supporting for Syriana and a directing for Good Night, for Good, Good, Night Good Luck. For Good Night, Good Luck, yeah. Yeah, um, I can't think of another time when the actor or director was nominated for both awards in the same year. Well, I have the answers for you. Uh, we could bring them up here. Uh, 2004, Clint Eastwood, Million Dollar Baby. Yep. Uh, we got Roberto Benigni. Yep, Benigni for for Life Is Beautiful. We got Clint Eastwood again for Unforgiven. We got Kevin Costner for Dance of the Wolves. Both this is writer and and actor. yeah, but these are for the same movie. Like, yeah, but, but he was just saying movies. But but he didn't qualify that. I think he, he said, did. He said just for the same year. I did no, he, he not for, put it. I, 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 I can't think, think of for another different time movies. an actor director was nominated for both awards in the same year. Oh, for different movies. For yeah, different for movies, movies. Oh, okay. right? See, I I can't off the top of my head. Think of another time that's happened either, that that somebody's been nominated. Now I can think of some times that somebody's there's been once or twice where an actress has been nominated for best lead actress in one movie and also nominated for best supporting actress in another movie. But like somebody who's been nominated as an actor and a director in two separate movies. George, that might be the only one. Wow. I, I can't think of another one off the top of my head. I, if you guys know any differently, please let us know because that's a really that's a good little bit of trivia, actually. All right. What do we got up next? Uh, we got Dalton uh, Burdett, I think. Yes. Uh, with the highest opening of Expendables franchise being $34 million, do you think Expendables 4 will open above or below that number? It was, it, it's been 11 years. It'll be below. Below. It'll be below. Now, listen. S Stallone makes sure these movies are done on a pretty reasonable budget. Mm -hmm. um, and... I, you, they don't need to make a whole ass load of money in order for people to walk away happy. Um, but with the way things are right now, plus a lot of people may see the Expendables franchise as being a little bit tired. I'm looking forward to this new one. I don't know if I'm a studio executive, if I would have greenlit it myself at this point, but it, it'll make less. The question will be how much less, because a little bit less will be fine. A little bit less will be fine, but I do think it'll be less. What do you plus think, worldwide, I think it's probably going to do well. You know, I think this franchise probably the reason they keep making them is because they don't have to make gigantic money because I bet they travel very well internationally. Yeah, yeah, probably. Who's the big name in this one? Like 50 Cent, right? It's 50 Megan Cent, Fox. the big edition. I mean, the big edition. Oh, does she get one? off of a motorcycle? <laughs> well, she hops on Jason Statham. I mean, that's <laughs> in the trailer. 
All right, let's do one more question. What's our last question here today? All right. Uh, should I run credits while I read this? Sure. Okay, so we're going to run a credits of our, uh, our wonderful channel members here, and I'll read our final question. So first up, or here we got Spencer Mothers. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Saw X for releasing a shot for shot remake of the Nicole Kidman AMC spot, but with Jigsaw uh, in place of Nicole Kidman. Some uh, Somehow self amputation feels good in a place like this. <laughs> Chef's kiss. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I have not even heard of this, that's I genius. haven't either. That's genius. That is like Ryan Reynolds <laughs> level guerrilla marketing kind of idea did they actually have the uh, I, ray look this up can you find this anywhere like amputation jigsaw feels good in a place, place like this self-amputation yourself <laughs> yeah it's like this because i uh, look i am one of these guys who kind of believes like oh okay saw is a franchise that is is its shelf life has expired i think you know that that's just me i know there are some people out there that are quite excited for saw x go. I remember uh, they tried to do, Chris Rock recently tried to kind of do a different sort of thing with the Saw franchise. And actually, that wasn't a bad little movie. No. To, to be honest with you, that wasn't a bad little movie. But I feel like it's kind of run its course. But listen, I have not seen this ad that we're talking about. But once I do, anything that kind of makes fun of that damn Nicole Kidman ad, and I say this to somebody who absolutely adores Nicole Kidman, I love her. But I am so over that freaking AMC. Yeah. You know, we're going to go tonight. We're three of us in this room are going to go tonight to go see Dumb Money. Woo. Uh, very, very stoked about that. But a part of me wants to go late just to avoid see, having to sit through that damn somehow heartbreak feels good in a place like this ad <laughs> for the 572nd time. But this idea is great. I don't, Rob, you got any interest in this uh, in this Scream X movie? Dude, I have to tell you, uh, <laughs> the uh, the it looks. Ray apparently really, is watching the ad spot right now. Uh, oh I mean, it looks really it looks good to me. They brought back Tobin Bell, you know, and I let Saw friend. You said Scream Saw franchise. Sorry, thank you, Saw. Um, I I think the Saw franchise of all the horror franchises of all of them, whether it's Friday the Thirteenth, Nightmare on Elm Street, I think the Saw franchise for what it is has probably delivered the goods more than any other <laughs> franchise in terms of... And I have to tell you, this trailer for Saw X looks pretty damn good. Ray, Ray is having a big oh, kick. Apparently... You had the volume on. Just the way he Just the way, head. yeah, the lighting and everything. <laughs> you All right. Gonna, I'm going to have to come over to your computer and take a look at this yeah. when we're done. And guys, speaking of which, that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making the show part of your day. Hey, for those of you who are YouTube channel members, a little bit later this evening at 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to have a channel members town hall meeting. If you guys want to come on by and uh, we'll chat amongst yourselves as host and YouTube channel members, we're going to have a discussion. I hope you guys will join me there for that uh big thank you to all you guys for sending you those topics and questions thank you to the guys in the room ray aura yep, yep, yep. jonathan voico <laughs> see you later writer director producer robert meyer burnett and uh my name of course is john campia thanks a lot for being here guys my name's john campia again and until <laughs> next time my friends bye-bye john campia <laughs>